States have been leveraging cyberspace in pursuit of geopolitical goals for decades. Uh, regional powers and great powers alike exploit the vulnerabilities in the space and the cracks in democratic societies to undermine democratic institutions, to threaten our critical infrastructure, and generally erode our national and collective power. Uh, today, the most dangerous state-sponsored malicious cyber activity, from my perspective, is that systematic degradation of democratic institutions via cyberspace. Europe has become accustomed to Russian meddling in democratic processes for decades, but the 2016 election in the United States was a wake-up call for us all. And there's increasing evidence now that Russia, China, Iran, and possibly others will seek to conduct similar disinformation operations and influence campaigns in the 2020 presidential elections in the United States. Uh, I'd say, you know, furthermore, one of Russia's key security priorities is to undermine and degrade Western alliances and security cooperation networks, including and especially NATO. Um, it's through the subver subversion of ideas, exploiting the cracks in these international alliance networks and indirectly encouraging domestic instability that Russia that makes Russia incredibly dangerous. Um, but the threat to democracy, I think, extends beyond just the U.S. and Europe. If you look at China, for example, state-linked firms have built up a massive global surveillance capacity, which they utilize to regularly harass foreign and domestic dissidents. Uh, these capabilities connect information, communication, technology, equipment, surveillance cameras, facial recognition software, and massive da data sets on private citizens. Uh, this marks a disturbing trend towards global authoritarianism, um, which threatens democracy sort of on a global scale. For me is the increasingly problematic probing into critical infrastructure. Um, we've seen what cyber attacks can do on this front. In 2012, Iran conducted a series of targeted cyber operations against the Saudi uh, state-owned oil firm, Saudi Aramco, uh, the Shamoon malware that they used led to over 30,000 computers being forced offline and rendered unusable, significantly disrupting Aramco's operations. Obviously in 2015 and 2016, Russian hackers crippled uh, the Ukrainian energy grid a few times uh, and left millions of people without, without power. Uh, but those attacks took place in a context of either heightened tension or frankly, an ongoing armed conflict. So they're not really escalatory. Uh, and this is sort of the reality of modern warfare. Cyber tools will be used and I wouldn't consider those events again, sort of escalatory, or at least not accidentally escalatory. However, what could lead to accidental escalation is, like I said, the continual efforts by nation states to create access to one another's critical infrastructure, often with no real intent to attack or manipulate during peacetime, um, but nonetheless to create access in you know, pursuit of potentially future operations. And there's plenty of public reporting on this trend. In 2012, Chinese state-sponsored groups targeted oil and natural gas pipelines in the United States over a period of several weeks. Uh, in May 2020, Germany reported that a Kremlin-based hacking group was continuing its long-running campaign to target German companies in the energy, power, and water sectors. In April 2020, uh, it was reported that China had, incre had been increasing its efforts to hack U.S. government agencies and healthcare institutions in order to steal research related to the coronavirus. Uh, and, you know, all the way back in early 2018, the Trump administration accused Russia of carrying out a series of cyber attacks on U.S. and European nuclear power plants and other utility infrastructure. Um, I would say that, you know, those attacks, uh, while not necessarily manipulating or causing damage, um, you know, we've seen uh, rumors, at least, of incidents where um, an intelligence agency or a military, military organization creates access to uh, a certain critical infrastructure accidentally causes some sort of damage uh, just because they don't know, you know, the, the lack of familiarity with the system that they're, they're exploiting uh, and potentially just, you know, a wrong stroke of the mouse or a wrong key click could, uh, could cause some sort of damage obviously not meaning to, but potentially leading to escalation. And I think, you know, the moment we see uh, cyber attacks uh, sort of carry over into the physical domain is the time when we're most likely to see this sort of accidental escalation happen. Successful deterrence depends on four factors. Um, a clearly communicated threat, so the deterrer must clearly communicate the threat so that the target is aware that the behavior uh, that they might engage in is undesirable and the consequences that will occur if they choose to ignore the threat. Uh, in addition to a clearly communicated threat, the threat must be credible, so the deterrer must have both the capability to and resolve or political will to follow through with the threat. 
Um, and then a sufficiently powerful threat is number three, and the deterrer must ensure that the costs threatened outweigh any potential benefits that the target may gain from conducting the undesired act action. And then the final piece of the puzzle for deterrence to work is reasonable assurance that the threat will not come to fruition if the undesired action doesn't take place, right? So if you do not do the thing I don't want you to do, I will not carry through on my threat. We also tend to conflate deterrence where one is attempting to prevent an action with compellence, where one is trying to change another's existing behavior. Uh, I think in the context of cyber, it's important to note that there has not been a major cyber operation that's caused thousands of deaths or millions of dollars in property damage or, frankly, escalated tensions between rival nations to the point of armed conflict. Not yet. So with that context, arguably deterrence is working at this higher level of activity, though we can't really rest on our laurels and expect it to continue. And I would also add that measuring the effectiveness of deterrence and therefore whether deterrence is working at this high level of activity can be difficult. It can be hard to determine whether or not a target chose to act because the deterrence threat worked, or if there was an unrelated reason, a confounding variable that prevented that type of action. Um, nonetheless, deterrence requires constant attention to maintain its effectiveness. Uh, and while it's arguably working at this high threshold of cyber attack, it's clearly not working to prevent states from undermining democratic institutions, for example, stealing state secrets or intellectual property, or continually probing into one another's critical infrastructure. And this is because deterrence at this level of activity could prove to be a difficult exercise in cyberspace for a number of reasons. Um, I'd point to sort of one rather, I think, obvious fact, but is, is often overlooked, and that is that deterrence is traditionally a military discipline. Uh, in cyber, the primary actors, especially from nation state perspectives, are often intelligence agencies, not necessarily militaries. And these two groups play by different rules, right? Intelligence agencies and militaries definitely adhere to different norms, definitely adhere to different versions of international law. Uh, the second major factor is that we're not really trying to prevent behavior uh, at this level, but we're trying to shape it, right? So activity is ongoing and persistent. In traditional deterrence, one sought to prevent the use of something. Here, the tools are already being used. So there are questions about whether par uh, deterrence is the right paradigm at that level of, of activity. And then finally, I'd say, um, you know, cyberspace affords states a certain degree of strategic ambiguity and flexibility, which many states desire. Uh, states may not want to communicate the full terms of the threat against the target and or communication and signaling can be misinterpreted. Uh, this is only compounded in cyberspace where states go to drastic measures to conceal their attacks, including through sort of misattribution campaigns, false flags, and proxies. Uh, if any doubts generated regarding the identity of the perpetrator behind a cyber attack, this both undermines the credibility of response options and reduces the hope of achieving timely and ultimately accurate attribution. <music>
the American people, our allies, and even our adversaries that the United States has the will, resolve, and ability. The strategy also builds on the, Depart the U.S. Department of Defense's concept of defend forward, which again integrates a whole of nation approach to securing American interests in cyberspace. Defend forward is this proactive notion that rather than uh, sort of being reactive to cyber attacks, uh, we must proactively observe pursue and counter adversary cyber operations by imposing strict costs that prevent their future uh, malicious cyber behavior.